we bow. Good morning, everyone. And I hope you're all safe and warm at home. If you are willing to, I know most of us <clears throat> are probably in our pajamas, but that doesn't matter here. It's, you can come to service in your gym jams day. Um, please feel, uh, would love to see your faces um, just to engage in that sense of community. So if you are up for it, please um, come on camera. I'd like to start this morning by, if everyone can just unmute themselves and say hello. Hello. Good morning. 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 Good morning, Good morning. everyone. Good to hear you guys all. Awesome. That's a practice I do in another um, a class, I, a Buddhist class I take. They uh, always start the class with everybody saying hello, and it's people from all over the world. Um, and we end the class by saying goodbye. So it's it's kind of fun to hear everybody and just know that you're out there in the ether. So from at this point, we're going to begin our chanting. I'm going to stick that in the chat in case anybody would like to chant along. I was hoping to take a screenshot and share it, but it seems I am not, I don't have those capabilities. Refuges are on page seven. I go for refuge to Buddha, my deeply awakened mind, the living source of understanding and compassion, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I go for refuge to Dharma, the path of mindful living, leading to healing, joy, and enlightenment, the way of peace, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the loving and supportive community of practice, realizing harmony, awareness, and liberation, which must be cultivated to be known fully. I am aware that the three jewels are within my heart. I vow to realize them. I vow to understand living beings and their suffering. I vow to cultivate loving kindness and compassion and to practice joy and equanimity. I vow to live simply and sanely, content with few possessions and to keep my body healthy. I vow to let go of all worry and anxiety in order to be light and free. I am aware that I owe so much to my parents, teachers, friends, and all beings. I vow to be worthy of their trust, to practice wholeheartedly so that understanding and compassion will flower and I can help living beings be free from their suffering. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. May the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha support my efforts. And we bow. And if you scroll down one page, you'll see the Heart Sutra. As a reminder, we chant this as an, as an up beat tempo. Kind of wake us up on this snowy, sleepy Sunday. The Maha Prajna 
Paramita Hridaya Sutra. The Bodhisattva of great compassion from the deep practice of prajna, paramita, perceived the emptiness of all five skandhas and delivered all beings from their suffering. O Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form, form is emptiness, emptiness form, the same is true of feeling, thought, impulse and consciousness. O Shariputra, all dharmas are empty. They are not born nor annihilated. They are not defiled nor immaculate. They do not increase nor decrease. So in emptiness, no form, no feeling, no thought, no impulse, no consciousness. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or objects of mind. No realm of sight, no realm of consciousness. No ignorance, nor extinction of ignorance. No old age and death, nor extinction of them. No suffering, no cause of suffering. No cease from suffering, no path to lead out of suffering, no knowledge, no attainment, no realization, for there is nothing to attain. The Bodhisattva holds on to nothing but prajna paramita. Therefore the mind is clear of any delusive hindrance. Without hindrance there is no fear. Away from all perverted views, one reaches final nirvana. All Buddhas of past, present, and future, through faith in prajna, paramita, attain to the highest perfect enlightenment. Know then the prajna, paramita, is the great Dharani the radiant peerless mantram, the utmost supreme mantram, which is capable of allaying all pain. This is true beyond all doubt. Proclaim now the highest wisdom, the prajna paramita. Gate, gate, para, gate, para sam gate, Bodhisvaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para sam gate, Bodhisvaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para sam gate, Bodhisvaha. The Maha Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. And we bow. All right. Again, good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see that there's folks tuning in. Um, again, would love to see your faces if you feel inspired to show up in, in a box. Um, but I totally understand if not. Today, I'm going to be talking about the story of Shanti Deva. And Shanti Deva is this author, Buddhist author and scholar that's known to have composed this book called 
the Bodhisattva guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, or what is known as the Bodhisattva Charyavatara. And this happened roughly in 700 AD. There is another book of his that is kind of like a training manual for the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, and it's his one of his lesser known works. Um, but the Bodhisattva Charyavatara is one that is highly revered, especially in um, Tibetan Buddhist cultures. Um, so Shanti Deva, he was this Buddhist master that um, studied at the monastic university of Nalanda in India. And his name, Shanti Deva, means peace angel. Shanti meaning peace and Deva meaning angel, or at least the closest equivalent that can be in English. So in Tibetan, it's pronounced Galse Shibala. And La, or what means angel or divine, um, and it refers to someone who has transformed their mind into a being that no longer has to experience the cycle of suffering. So this can also refer to a teacher or someone who has a higher understanding of the teachings. Uh, Lama Ugyen once explained um, this word Lama or La as one who looks down from above and La in Tibetan also means from a higher point of view. Um, and so again, just to kind of put that whole quote together, one who looks down from above, La, with the love that a mother, Ma, has for her children. So if you think about this teacher who is looking down at their students from this perspective of somebody who has great care and compassion for these, this mind that is still developing. That's what La means. So Geshe or Galse Shewala. Shanti Deva. So this story come. This story goes that he came from a place of royalty. Um, he was a prince. He was the son of King. Now I may totally butcher this name, but I'll do my best. King Kalyana Varman, um, in the Bengal region of East India, and he didn't really want to be a king. He was really more invested in his spiritual studies, but when his father had passed, he had this deep realization that he wouldn't be able to serve people at best as a king but by being a bodhisattva because he cared for all beings when he was asked to take the throne he saw that this was an opportunity to support his kingdom and the people in it so this evening before he was prepared to be crowned king um, he had a dream and in this dream, he walks into the throne room in this palace, and it's this beautiful, elaborate room where his father conducts business. And there, sitting in the throne, he sees the Bodhisattva Manjushri, who's also known as Gentle Voice. And Manjushri says to him, you cannot sit on this throne. And in this cultural tradition, you can't sit on a throne that your teacher sits on. So you can almost equate this to the matrix um, as if Morpheus is sitting on this throne and is presenting Neo with the red pill or the blue pill, right? He's kind of saying, do you want to be the king or do you want to pursue this path of enlightenment? And so Manjushri is presenting Shantideva with this choice. And this was the sign to turn away from the crown and instead walk this path of a monastic life. And so he wakes up from the dream and chooses to listen to his teacher Manjushri's advice um, because he knows that being king isn't what he's meant to do in life. And so to think about it, had he not listened to this dream and instead stayed king, he never would have written this beautiful masterpiece called The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And this text not only cares for the minds of those who have heard this teaching when it was delivered, but it's also been transmitted and passed down through generations of students and is still relevant to us in today in 2024. See, Manjushri knew that this was his purpose. So, 
after he has this dream, he ends up leaving his his castle, the kingdom, this um, place that he had known, very similar to the story of the Buddha. And he began his travels by heading into the jungle and studying with these non-Buddhist gurus. And kind of like how the Buddha went in and studied with the ascetics, but he realized that these teachers could only take him so far. So he then continued his travels to make his way to the monastic community at the University of Nalandra, where he was ordained as a monk. And he studied sutras and he studied the secret practices deeply, but he kind of kept this to himself. He didn't share this with the community broadly. So his studies were very important to him. And he didn't really go and study in the library with the other students. He didn't really show show up as much around other people. Um, and I, you know, I have my theories as to why he did this, but you can discover your own as I talk a little bit more about what happened. Um, so he really just wanted to perfect his practice. Um, so even though he was incredibly devout in his studies, he came off to everybody else as being this lazy practitioner. And there is this nickname that is given to people like this in the monasteries. And if you know this nickname, I would love to see you drop it in the chat. If you know what uh, Gelse Shewala's nickname was, in Sanskrit, it is busuku. But anybody know what the English translation is? I can give you the Tibetan translation. It's duše sumbawa. I don't see that anybody lighten up the chat, so I guess I'll just give you the answer. So his name, his nickname was Mr. Three Thoughts. Does anybody know what Mr. Three Thoughts means? Some of you might if you were in the Bodhisattva um, class on uh, last Saturday. No, no one wants to engage in the chat. <laughs> so Mr. Three Thoughts means to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. And it's used in the monasteries to describe really lazy people or people who put in the minimal amount of work to get by. And so when you think about living in this large community of monastics, um, there are those who are incredibly well studied and have been doing this for years and have you know, really refined their um, their view of wisdom and then there are those who are aren't quite there maybe they like to put off the image that they do study really hard or they just haven't quite made those realizations yet and those who really had this taste of wisdom could see his true efforts they could see that shanti deva was wise beyond his years and really had this understanding of the buddha's teachings and then there were those who judged him out of their own misunderstanding. And this story is a great lesson in non-judgment because we don't always know the whole story that's going on in somebody else's life. So these monks who had this misunderstanding, they wanted to kick him out of the monastery, but they knew that if they just kicked him out, it would create bad karma for them. So they decided that instead they would get him to embarrass himself and basically force him out. Um, and so they approached him one day right before they were going to have this really big ceremony. And normally before ceremonies, they invite somebody from the monastery, one of the students to give a talk and they asked him to speak. And normally when you speak you have to have these teachings memorized and you have to be able to um, expound them to the entire community and they knew that he didn't show up to uh, to practice in the library very often to practice his memorizations and so they thought that this would be the best way to like teach him a lesson and get him to leave and 
so he said, well, you know, are, are you sure? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't even know if I'm really that knowledgeable enough to speak at an event like this, you know, playing it very humble. And they, they convinced him, they were like, yeah, no, you, you know, you could totally do this. This is no problem. And so, you know, he, he reluctantly agrees to, to give the speech. And so to make it even more embarrassing, normally they have teachers sit on a throne in, in these lecture halls. Um, so that way everybody can see the teacher and hear them expound whatever teaching they're reciting. And they decided to build this like 15 foot tall throne, which is practically impossible to climb up to without a ladder. And they purposely left the ladder off of the throne as the, just another way to be like, let's just really send this home um, to get him out of here. And so <laughs> that evening, as everybody's in the lecture hall waiting to hear Shanti Davis speak, you know, these monks are kind of sitting in the back of the hall, chuckling to themselves, thinking like, yeah, we got him now. And so as Shanti Deva approaches the throne, they're, they're watching and they're convinced that this plan is going to work. But then all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, he was at the top of the platform, sitting in this lotus position, ready to expound this wisdom. And, you know, their jaws are kind of dropped to the floor and they're kind of like, wait, what just happened? And when he's up there, he asks the, the group, the congregation, his community, do you want to hear a traditional teaching or do you want to hear something new? And so the monks are sitting there like, oh, this guy's asking for it. And of course they ask for a brand new teaching. They're like, we want to hear something we've never heard before. And, you know, thinking that how could this person, you know, Mr. Three Thoughts ever have any kind of wisdom that could possibly, they could possibly hear. And that's when he begins reciting the Bodhisattva's way of life. And as he's expounding this, this poetry, you can see this realization of their mistake dawning on their face and that they had given into their judgments that they didn't follow the teachings. And so he's up there expounding this incredible work and the monks are becoming more and more captivated by this, this wisdom that he's teaching. And so there's 10 chapters in the way of the Bodhisattva. And when he gets to the ninth chapter, which is the chapter on wisdom, um, it's said that his mind was so expansive that, and it was more expansive than the space of the lecture hall that he couldn't physically stay in the space anymore. And I know this sounds really fantastic and, um, you know, ethereal. And it's, it's amazing just the story that has been passed down through the years about this. But they say that his mind was more expansive than the lecture hall. So his body began to float upwards and all they could hear was his voice. And so they're listening to this deep explanation on emptiness. And as he's floating away, there are some monks who attained this supernatural skill of um, telepathy or being able to hear him speak beyond this reasonable degree of what the senses normally are capable of. And they continued to listen to him expound this work. And those who didn't have this ability were watching him floating away and he was getting quieter and quieter and quieter. And, you know, we're trying to figure out what is he saying? What is this, this knowledge that he's saying? And so after, after he expounds both chapter nine and chapter 10, and only those who have this ability to hear him hear it, um, you know, they're all like, well, where'd he go? How do we get him back? He needs to be here. And so these monks who made this mistake of losing this incredible teacher, um, they attempted to try and write down this, this uh, poet poem that he had expounded all of these verses and um you know they were in debates some of them the ones who couldn't hear the last two chapters and the ones that could they were in debate that were there only nine chapters because they heard him as he was disappearing starting on the ninth chapter or were there ten chapters because there were some of the monks that could hear him as he was floating away and the ones that had the ability to hear him said, no, there's 10 because there was a chapter on dedication. And so 
eventually the monastery gets word that he was located somewhere in South India and they send this delegation to go and find him. And when they get there, they're just like apologizing, like, please come back to Nalandra, please come and teach us. And he was like, nope, not coming back. And so they're there and he says, well, well since you're here, I will um, teach you another work that I've written called the Compendium of Trainings. And then he says, oh, by the way, if you want written copies of these, they're tucked away in the rafters of my room. And then Mas Master Shantideva goes off to live this life of a solitary bodhisattva, helping people in the background. And, you know, he could have appeared as a beggar or maybe a normal person. Um, and this is just how he served. He chose to serve people. He really wasn't interested in the praise. He really just wanted to help beings in the capacity that he could. And, and that really reflects back to what the, the mistake that these monks made early on in the monastery. You know, he really wasn't studying for the glory. He, he just wanted to perfect this practice um, without demonstrating to others, you know, and that's usually what our ego craves. It wants to be noticed by others. It wants others to see the work that we're doing um, as a sense of validation. And Shanti Deva didn't need that. He really just, he knew that if he could realize the teachings with the help of his teacher Manjushri, that he would be able to help so many more people. And there are these really great stories that I won't go into um, that follow his life afterwards. Um, and they're also pretty fantastic as well. Um, you know, helping kings and helping communities and stopping war and just, you know, really living the life of a bodhisattva. And so this book, the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, the guide to the bodhisattva's way of life, it asks us to connect to this deeper meaning of why. Why are you on this path? Why are you reading this book in the first place? Why are you studying? What are the benefits of bodhicitta? And for those who may not know, bodhicitta means to be a spiritual warrior and to fight against the mental afflictions of your own mind. Um, and this is the true battleground. So you can cultivate a state of mind that knows how to help all beings wake up from their misunderstanding. Bodhicitta literally means mind of enlightenment, at least as best we can translate it. And so in order to do this, we have to be able to investigate ourselves. We have to be able to look at the good and the bad within our own minds. And we're asked to examine these habits that we've cultivated in our life and that have brought and continue to bring good outcomes as well as the not so good outcomes. Um, ones that may have led to further anger, misunderstanding, laziness, regret, doubt, and desire, the hindrances. Um, the one appropriate desire to have, though, is this desire to strive on the path towards helping other beings towards liberation. And that is the desire of a bodhisattva. And so in our own lives, when we are identifying our why, it is this encouragement to crack open your heart and to let go of these things that no longer serve you and to instead cultivate this thing that's going to benefit all beings. But it's our effort that's going to make all of these positive causes and conditions that are going to make a difference in the world. So if you think about it, there is this indefinite truth about being human and our lives are going to end at some point it's the reality of being a human being and rather than let this short experience slip through your hands without reaching towards this beautiful understanding one that in our tradition of buddhism this is this is the most beautiful gift that your lifetime could have is to reach towards this joy towards enlightenment, towards liberation from suffering, and to do it within this community that is there to support you. Um, you know, Shanti Deva presented us with a way to develop this in our life, to develop this goodness, to reach towards this 
way to turn the world into a Buddha field, into the most perfect paradise that you could imagine. And he gives us this insight in how we can examine these unbeneficial behaviors and guides us in transforming them to the benefit of all beings. And so this text is revered as one of the most important books in Tibetan Buddhism for its teachings on compassion and altruism. And some people study this text for their entire lives, practicing with it in hopes that they too can serve the, way, serve the world in the same way that Master Shantideva did. And to think that this teaching was initially intended for monks these are people who are already, you know, studying the Buddhist teachings, who are already reaching towards enlightenment. And you would think that they wouldn't need instruction on compassion, patience, and wisdom. However, this story likes to tell us otherwise. Now, if they need instruction on these things, how much more so are lay practitioners in the modern era? So I hope that just learning a little bit about Shanti Deva's life leaves you with some inspiration to train your mind and to work towards seeing the world as this limitless, perfect, beautiful place that it has the capacity to be. Um, and while that also might sound far reaching, doesn't enlightenment also sound far reaching? And that if we have these things to support us in reaching towards that, in getting to a place where we can alleviate suffering from our lives and other beings, you know, why not take it? Why not walk the path, try it out, try it on, see if it fits. And if you find that, you know, it doesn't work for you, you know, that's what the Buddha said, take what works and leave what doesn't. So I'd like to end um, by reciting Master Shanti Deva's prayer. And I'm going to stick this in the chat if you feel like chanting along with me. May I become at all times, both now and forever, a protector of those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp for those without light, a place of refuge for those who lack shelter, and a servant to all in need. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. Thank you. So at this time, Prepare yourself for meditation in whatever seated posture that you feel called to. If you are laying down, you can lay down. If you're seated, just make sure that you're in a position that you can park your body comfortably for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I am going to be guiding you through a bliss meditation or what is known as a rejoicing meditation. And if you would rather to just sit sit quietly for the next um, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, put me on mute. <laughs> and we're going to start with a body scan just to, and then calm and um, settle the mind with some breath. Um, and the intention here is to reflect on a positive object, uh, something that we are going to be rejoicing in. Um, this is going to be like a moment of kindness. So at this time, make sure you're in a cof comfortable position. If you're seated, which is how I'll be leading this guided meditation, um, make sure your sits bones are grounded and your hips are slightly higher than your knees. Um, and feel free to use any supports, uh, anything that might help you in your meditation. It's really important to be comfortable so we can leave the body alone and we can work with our mind. Um, your spine should be straight but soft. Align your shoulders with the floor. Um, soften the brows and let the tongue rest just on the roof of the mouth. And, and just let that body begin to relax. And if you haven't already, allow your eyes to close and 
relax into a meditative expression. Taking a deep breath, slow breath, in through your nose, filling up the lungs. Hold at the top for just a second. Slowly exhale through the nose, releasing any stale air that might be still sitting in the bottom of your lungs. And just find a rhythm of breath that works for you as you settle into your body. taking this opportunity to check in with your posture. Bring your awareness to your feet and legs. Notice anywhere you might need to apply any micro adjustments to sink more comfortably into your meditation. Notice any tension that you might be holding on to and just let it go. Bring your awareness to the area just above your hips. Gently tuck in the belly button just a little bit to help stabilize your lower back. Open up your shoulders, allowing the shoulder blades to create some space in the chest. And continue to breathe naturally. Soften the neck maybe open and close the mouth a couple of times to engage and encourage just this softening around your jaw. Release any tension at the brow and around the eyes and at the corners of your lips, allow just a gentle smile just to tease. This smile is an encouragement to soften the muscles in your face and a reminder to bring a little bit of joy to this practice. Make a commitment to withdraw from the space around you and to dive into your mind. Allow the sounds around you to begin to fade far off into the distance. Notice any thoughts or emotions, but we're, we're not going to get hooked by them. To focus and brighten your attention, bring your awareness to the sensation of the breath right at the tip of your nose or on your upper lip. See if you can notice as if for the first time, every exhale, every detail of the inhale. You don't need to control it. Just see if you can follow this rhythm of the breath as it interacts with your body. With each inhale, you feel bright and uplifted, feeling relaxed and centered with every exhale. If any distractions arrive, just gently return to the breath. Celebrate any time that you catch this happening, this ability to return, growing your ability to focus.
as the mind quiets, you might be able to notice more detail in the breath. Maybe observe the temperature difference between each inhale and exhale. Notice the spaciousness of your mind. Settled and expansive. In this focused state of mind, I invite you now to bring to mind a moment of kindness that you've done for someone else. A moment where you've added positivity to somebody else's life. It could be something simple, something that you may you might not have noticed before, like maybe making a cup of tea or bringing in the mail for a neighbor. Maybe it's um, listening to somebody's problems or just remembering to call a loved one. Whatever it is, just let your mind Rediscover memory after memory where you brought kindness to someone else. And pick one moment that you feel connected to and bring that to the center of your mind. Like watching a movie on the big screen. You can see yourself and this person that you've brought kindness to. This person who brought kindness to you. Try to rejoice in this goodness by playing this moment over and over and just see the effects of your kindness on somebody else. They felt seen, they feel acknowledged. Just notice their response to your kindness. Now shift your focus to look at you. There must have been this spark of compassion for you to want to reach out and give this unconditional kindness. Feel good about giving this kind of kindness, this kindness that's in your heart and allow it to grow, allow this feeling to expand. It's okay to rejoice in your goodness. It is okay to feel happy. On the next inhale, allow this goodness to marinate every cell of your body, every part of your mind as you recognize that this human kindness is alive in you. And on your next exhale, imagine this feeling reaching out to those around you that need some kind of kindness in their life. Send this feeling out to them like a gift and give it away to as many people as you can think of.
Gently allow your attention to return to your body. Take an inhale and an exhale. Bring some movement, wiggling the fingers and toes, maybe gently rolling your shoulders back or circling your head. And when you're ready, come back to the room and open your eyes. Welcome back. So if you don't practice rejoicing in this kindness, this goodness, it can feel foreign to celebrate. And we're often taught that we have to be humble or modest and we have to downplay our successes to avoid coming off as being boastful. But if you're anything like me and you feel this looming sense of imposter syndrome, we sometimes struggle to internalize this goodness that we put out into the world. And we can feel like our positive behavior is undeserving of attention. But the intention behind this practice of rejoicing in your goodness is so that you can transform the inner world to benefit all beings. And if we can't recognize our own progress through the six perfections as taught by Shanti Deva, how are we ever going to get a pulse on our own progress? It feels good to make other people feel good. And that alone returns goodness back to us as long as we're capable and able to recognize it. And this self-support helps us move through the world with more intentional awareness, often showing us where we can inject more goodness into the world. Um, so today I invite you, as you go throughout your day, see if there's a moment that comes up where you might be able to inject a little bit more goodness into the world. So at this time, um, I would like to open the floor for joys and concerns. Um, you can either type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Joy, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all your faces and hear your voices. Um, today marks uh, two weeks sober from smoking for me, which has been a huge obstacle for me. So I feel really great about it. Thank you. I have a joy. Um... I don't know if you've been seen, but on my camera, this is my new rescue dog. I don't know if you can see, but she's blind. Um, and she she has been a huge joy for me. Um, I just rescued her a couple weeks ago. And I'm actually a foster mom. And it's interesting. I've learned more about, you know, challenges and being courageous and overcoming you know, just obstacles in your life from this sweet dog that I have uh, from any books or any podcasts or anything like that about fostering. Um, she's brought me and my family so much joy and just so much peace and um, teachings. I've learned so much from her just in the last few weeks that I've had her. So it's been a huge joy to have her in our life. Thank you. want to share joy i'm just glad that we're able to um attend have the temple services happening and despite this bad weather um and still have everyone be able to remain safe and warm in their homes and off of the roads so um, i hope everyone here i'm in saint joe and it's this morning when i took the dog out it was 11 degrees and 11 below zero with the wind chill so um so thankful that we could still have our temple services uh, despite the weather. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, if that's it, wonderful to share some joys and we'll hold some space for any concerns, any unvoiced concerns. Just take a moment of silence. So some temple-related announcements. Let me just pull up the email here. And I can never remember what our exact order is, so I'm just going to go off of what we have in our um, newsletter. So um, next Saturday we have an upcoming winter retreat. It's a silent retreat. Um, there will be... Uh, various styles of meditation. We'll have um, a Soto Zen style chanting service. There's work practice, walking meditation, all kinds of things. Um, and their registration is open online. It's all day at the temple from 8 to 5 p.m. Saturday after next. Oh, see, I'm, week I'm living a week ahead of myself. It's on the 27th. Thank you, Kunga for keeping me honest. Um, there will be lunch. It'll be a vegan potluck. So if you can bring a dish to um, share and just include all the uh, ingredients for those who have food preferences or allergies or food sensitivities. Um, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be a lovely day to practice with the Sangha. We also have an intermediate meditation class scheduled for Saturday, February 24th from 9 to noon, and it'll be at the temple, and registration is open online. We have our online meditation group on Wednesdays from 7 to 7.45 p.m. via Zoom. If you're interested in joining us for that, we love having people come and sit with us. Um, you can contact Reverend Kunga for more information. Um, that's open to beginners, advanced meditators, anybody who would like to practice with the group. Thursdays, we have a Dharma discussion group uh, from 9.30 to 11 a.m. It meets at the temple. Uh, it's good to stay in touch with um, Reverend Jingsu, Ryan Duffield, who is leading that group in case of any um, imminent weather, um, and you can contact him for more information. We have our Buddhist space recovery meetings uh, Mondays at 6 p 6 30 p.m meditation begins 7 p.m uh, meeting begins and that's at the temple wednesdays at 6 30 at the alano club and fridays 10 5 meditation begins and 10 30 the meeting begins at the temple and i think i've covered all of our announcements uh oh meetings we have a the third sunday of each month which is Next Sunday, the 21st, the board of directors um, have their meeting and Sangha members are invited to observe. It happens at 1130 right after service. Are there any other announcements? Um, one announcement I wanted to share is um, our two of our teachers, um, Sun Shin, um, Aaron Garcia, and Shin Q, Brian Cote, will be receiving their formal ordinations as um, as teaching monks in the Soto Zen tradition from uh, their, tuti, uh, their teacher, Shuji. Um, and that'll be the um, first Saturday of February at 1 p.m. So um, there will be an announcement put out to remind everyone, but we're just really happy for them and invite everyone who can is available to come and, and attend that um, Soto service to see them get their Soto ordinations. Thank you. I'll make the last announcement. Um, uh, this uh, temple operates off of donations. Um, nobody receives a paycheck. And if you feel called to uh, donate to the temple, there are, you can donate through the website. 
Um, and when this is up on, I don't know if the donation would still be up once the live, uh, or once this is posted on YouTube, that part of the technology is beyond me. Um, but don donations help in um, making sure that we can maintain our space. Um, but if you don't have the means to donate with funds, time is also something we're incredibly grateful for. We have a wonderful a crew of people who come and clean the temple um, or donations like toilet paper and tissues and cough drops and things like that. Um, you can reach out if uh, to know what maybe we're short on supply with. So if that is it for announcements, we are going to do our closing gathas. And I am going to put the rituals handbook back in the chat again. This is on page nine. And together we say, for all unskillful action ever committed by me since of old, on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance, born of my body, mouth, and thoughts, now I atone for them all. Vast is the robe of compassion, a formless field of benefaction. I wear the Buddhist teachings for the benefit of all sentient beings. All beings, one body, I vow to liberate. Endless blind passion, I vow to uproot. Dharma gates without number, I vow to penetrate. The great way of Buddha, I vow to attain. And before we log off, uh, it would be great if we could all unmute ourselves and say goodbye. Thank you, Agisu. That was wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe out there you. if you got to get out there. I'm staying in all day. <laughs> I hope you I'm all stay I warm. Off too. You too. <sighs> Thank you so much, Agesu. I'm glad we could still have the service and uh, stay out of it. It was nasty this morning. I could just tell from my girlfriend saying,